Okay, welcome everyone to our today's webinar using requirements-based staff in the for critical development. My name is Amy Johnson and I'm going to be your host today. Uh, if you have any problem, you know, with your voice or you don't hear me, then please just raise your hand and we're going to fix it right away. So, um, we have a little webinar info before we start. Then um, the live demonstration will be followed by a QA session. So if you have any questions, type it in and we're going to answer to that one. The webinar is recorded and it is available at our website. And uh, feel free to sign up for our upcoming webinars um, find information on the same uh, URL. Uh, our upcoming webinar is going to be next week, same time. It is about ELM for project managers, about Cumber dashboards, reports, and traceability. Sorry, I'm just recording. Have some message in here. All right. Um, about the voice, I tried to speak up a little bit. So uh, we prepared an agenda today. It is we're going to talk about uh, what requirement-based testing is, about the pros and the cons of requirement-based testing, about um, setting up requirement-based testing in safety critical projects and about Copimer, how Copimer can help you with requirement-based testing. Before we start today, I would love to say a few words about Inland Software. Our company is founded in 1998. Our headquarters is in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, our tool called Copimer ELM. Uh, we have our offices as well in Silicon Valley, uh, United States. Um, our partners are Lufthansa Industry Solutions, and we have resellers in the United Kingdom, China, Korea, Taiwan, France, and Italy. We have um, clients from different industries. As you can see on the screen, we have clients from medical industries such as Datatrack or Medtronic, from the automotive industry such as Continental, Timeler, Mercedes-Benz, or from the aviation and defense industry, from the high-tech embedded industry, and from many other industries. So the first is uh, how we would love to start is uh, what is a requirements-based testing. So requirements-based uh, tasks demonstrate that the system meets the requirements and thereby provides value. Consequently, requirements-based tests are the most important tasks. They confirm that the product is doing something useful. In these tasks, the way the system meets the requirement is not important, only the fact that the relevant inputs and conditions produce expected results. This, demonstra uh, this demonstrates that the requirements are met. As you can see here, um, uh, you could also you know, read on the screen that um, it also includes functional tasks, non-functional attributes, for example, performance, reliability, or usability. Requirements are almost always poorly defined, or at least not defined as well as is desirable. So requirements-based tests can be no better than the requirements they are testing. On the other hand, requirements-based testing is only one of, one of the several methods that, can, that together can provide an appropriate monitoring on quality of the system. Therefore, this form of testing should not be used alone, but as a complementary testing activity. And now moving on, I'm talking a little bit about the goals. Um, as mentioned before, in many cases, the requirements are not well defined. To improve our poorly defined requirements, Requirements-based software testing can include reviews of the requirement clarity and testability. A requirement lacks testability when one cannot create tests to demonstrate that the, um, that the requirement has been met. So the most common reason why a requirement is not testable is because it is not sufficient, not sufficiently clear. Unclear or untestable requirements are likely to be implemented incorrectly and could pose a risk to the success of your project. So 
So um, as you could see on the screen, the major goals, um, right? Just got in some sort of note in here, I'm sorry. So the, um, the major goals of the testing is um, one is validating the requirements are correct, complete, uh, and testable. And another goal is uh, to create necessary and sufficient set of test cases from the requirements. Obviously, to ensure that the design and the code fully met the requirements. There are um, some requirements towards the testing process. The testing must be carried out in a timely manner. Testing process should add value to the software life cycle and it needs to be effective. Testing the system um, exhaustively is impossible, hence the testing process needs to be uh, efficient as well. And testing must provide the overall status of the project, hence it should be manageable. So talking about the um, arguments, so about pro and contra, uh, what are the positive and the, and the negatives? of, of um, requirements-based testing is um, the advantages of requirements-based testing are that using this method provides information about the coverage of requirements with tests and also about how much the system implements these requirements. It is, easy, it is also easy to follow the testing of different features. If the input of the task plan is the the requirements test specification. So in other words, your, you test exactly what the software functionality in question is supposed to do and nothing else. So um, another thing is the delivering task cases. So delivering uh, task cases um, and collecting coverage information starting from requirement is, is a straightforward process. That is also an advantage of this method. Analyzing tax coverage helps you to understand what percentage of your requirements have been covered by successful test cases or how your test activities were. The fact that uh, requirements are in many cases poorly defined is an important argument against using requirements-based testing or a great uh, incentive to make sure the requirements are well defined. It is also a common misunderstanding to confuse design uh, requirements with functional requirements. In the test cases, um, in the test cases that prove the system works as it was designed, we can think that all its requirements were met. So, um, uh, yeah, moving forward. I would love a little bit to say about the safety critical development and development environment. So the term itself, safety critical, refers to systems that either can cause harm or are responsible for preventing harm. Such systems range from medical devices to automotive embedded systems, for example, uh, um, braking system, nuclear uh, power plant controls, avionic flight management system, and so on. The list is really long. Most safety critical systems must be validated by a regulatory body to ensure that they are fit for purpose. This means that proper and major development practices have been applied towards this, what let's just call it system correctness as the outcome and um, to the objective of the relevant standards can be demonstrated. So compliance is one of the major challenges that safety clinical developers are facing. Being able to show and prove that you are that you have used the right processes um, through the development is essential. Similarly, establishing relationship between work items from requirements all the way to release it is key. Using requirements-based testing could help you achieve this end-to-end -end traceability. Now, I would love to um, give you, um, talk to you a little bit about the best practices, as you can see here on my slide. So um, I think now we can say that we understand the benefits of requirements-based testing, but it's often a question how to plan such testing activities. 
So um, in a effective um, test cycle must have a defined set of processes and deliverables. Which processes and deliverables are applied to any given testing situation are depending on the available resources. So on the people, source, materials, time, ADC, so anything else. And the mandate of the task organization. The primary processes, deliverables, for requirement-based um, function tests are the, uh, the task planning, so the scope, the schedule, the, deliver, the deliver, deliverables for the functional test cycles, task plan, are to be defined during planning. The uh, functional, the second one is the functional decompo decomposition, which means um, that it, it breaks, it is, it is the breakdown of the system into its functional components or functional areas. Then um, the another one is what you need to consider is the requirement verification. So the requirement should be verified for clarity, testability, and design, and design requirements should be separated from functional requirements. Um, the next one to consider is the task case design and the traceability identification. So test cases need to be traced, mapped back to the appropriate requirements, but is to provide traceability from product requirements over the test cases. Then the tax execution and the defect man, uh, management. So um, um, it is the job of the task organization to record and manage any defects that happen during the task execution and obviously in all or any phases of the testing. And last but not least, uh, very important is the coverage analysis. So during functional tasks, a periodic progress report should be delivered by the task organization to the project team. The, the, uh, the base for this report uh, will be, or it is the, the coverage analysis of the requirements against test cases and outstanding defects. So I hope I could give you a little bit intro. Oops, sorry, my mistake. Um, and now I would love to ask, before we move to the, um, to the live demonstration, I would love to ask a few questions. Um, the first question is, um, interesting, what tools are you searching for? It is, uh, do you search for um, the manage requirements, tasking, your entire development life cycle, or your agile project, or your multiply agile project? So please um, answer to the question. Thank you. And I have uh, one more question before moving to the our live demonstration. It is about uh, what software development method are you using? It is a Gile, Scrum, Waterfall, or Hybrid? Thank you. And now, I would love to ask my colleague, Shandor, to give you an insight into our live demonstration. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. My, my name is Shandor Sabo, and I would like to give you uh, some insight about uh, the latest development in CodeBeamer concerning two requirement based testing and uh, and testing itself and also traceability. So one one large improvement in CodeBeamer which was introduced in 8.0.0 was the uh, suspected uh, support for references and all, all types of associations. Before 8.0.0, CodeBeamer supported the suspected links only on certain types of associations, like the copy of uh, type association. And in 8.0.0, we extended it to the, uh, to the references of tracker fields and all types of associations. 
Uh, it means that if you have a field in a tracker which points to another uh, tracker item, uh, you can set up the uh, uh, suspected alert and I will show you how you do it in from code beam A00. So here what we can see uh, is a test case tracker and this is the document view of the test case tracker. On the left side you can see the test cases in this tree structure and in the center panel you can see the, the names of the test cases or summaries of the test cases and the test steps. Currently they are collapsed. So what I will do is I will navigate to the customization, the tracker customization page of CodeBeamer in which you can customize what fields, what properties a tracker have, what properties tracker items have. And uh, CodeBeamer uses the field called verifies to connect the test cases to the requirements and other tested items. So if we take a look to the setup of this, custom, uh, this verifies field, we can see here that there is a new user interface part which is about uh, the reference itself. So when the, the verifies field contains a requirement, it is referring to a requirement or, an, or a task or a bug or some item. And uh, in the field properties you can set up that the suspects will be propagated. And here we have another feature also, by the way, the reverse suspect, which means that if you check this checkbox, the suspected link will go to both directions. If any of the two changes, the other will be suspected. Uh, we also uh, implemented here um, a new feature that the, the field reference can point uh, to a, a historic version of the other item. So it's not necessary that uh, the reference is always pointing to the head revision of the other item, but you can choose a historic revision. Uh, on, um, so when you set up the test cases to propagate the suspect, as you can see that the checkbox is now uh, uh, checked. So if you set up, it's a default setting. And uh, it means that uh, if any test case verifies a requirement, for example, the suspected link will work. So let's go back to, to the test case and see that requirement two test, uh, uh, here on the right side you can see that it's verifying on the requirement two. And since requirement two is changed, now it's suspected. Um, and if any test case is verifying a requirement, so let's see here another one, uh, requirement 3 test. The requirement 3 test is verifying requirement 3. If I modify requirement 3, the uh, test case will be suspected. So by setting up this suspected link on the tracker level, it will be a default setting and all of the test cases with this verified field with suspected in case of changing the dependent, the, the other uh, item. This is a default settings, but uh, from 8.0.0 you can do more. You can customize the suspected behavior item by item, and I also so show this to you. So here we have this, um, this uh, test case requirement to test. Let's edit the test case. On the edit test case page, we have the verifies field and we can see that it points to requirement 2. Now, uh, the new feature is that we implemented here a small overlay. If you click on this rectangle icon, an overlay appears and on the overlay you can set up several things. You can set up that this propagate suspect uh, uh, is checked, then this item will be will propagate the suspects from the dependent item. So you can override the default settings item by item on the edit tracker item page this way. You can also set up the reverse suspect and here uh, you can you can uh, choose uh, item by item which historic revision uh, the test case should point to. So it means that you can choose that if you leave these uh, drop downs empty, you, you can choose that um, the head revision is, is uh, referenced, but 
that if you click on a baseline, here we have the current head. This is when it's always pointing to the head. But here we have another item, test baseline one. It's a, it's a concrete baseline. If you select the baseline, then uh, this reference will point to the baseline version of this item. Or you can explicitly select historic revisions of the, of the item. You can select any version. You can even see that the version 2 is the, the member of baseline 1. So you can select a, a version and you can point to this version. Of course, if you point to a historic version of an item, the suspected link is senseless because historic version will never change. So if you want to use the suspected link, you have to use the head revision because it's always changing. So this is, uh, these are the new features concerning to the uh, suspected uh, feature and now let's see the next thing to, to show which is the trace stability browser so as we could hear uh, in the uh, presentation uh, the traceability the best practice is to set up the traceability and follow the traceability from the product requirements to the lowest level the test cases and test runs and uh, CodePayMail provides uh, several features to support this. So now we have a project in which we, I show you quickly the trackers page. We have a project in which we have customer requirement specifications. From the customer requirement specifications, there are system requirement specifications which were derived from these customer requirements. The system requirement specifications are verified by test cases which are uh, collected into test sets and the test sets are uh, executed in test runs. So there is, it's, um, there are several levels of detail here, but it's still a simple model comparing to the ones that are in the industry, which are also fully supported. Let's see in this simple model how the traceability, this end-to-end -end traceability is working. So we have here the traceability browser of customer requirement specifications, which means that customer requirement specifications is the first level. All the others will be, to, so to say, compared to this level. So let's add now another level, which will be the system uh, requirement specifications. And uh, let's compute the matrix now. So matrix is automatically computed. And we can see that the requirements on the system requirement specification level are derived from the customer requirements. So let's continue this uh, 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 breakdown to uh, further uh, items. Let's add now the test cases. And let's see the result. So now we can see that uh, the, the system requirements are verified by two test cases. And one of them is suspected. You can also use the traceability matrix to uh, discover the suspected, the list of suspected items by, by using this list. And um, uh, we can also continue the drill down to the test sets. So I just add the test sets to the view. And here you can see that both of these test cases belong to one test set. And finally, we can add the test runs. And if I click Show Dependencies, we can see the test runs uh, are also displayed with, together with the results. And uh, so this is how we provide the traceability from the customer requirement to the test runs. If you have a model in your, uh, you have a working model in which from the requirements you derive tasks, or uh, subtasks or other lower level units, you can also use the traceability matrix because it is completely flexible to display the traceability and the suspected information also in these uh, more difficult models without any problem. It's completely flexible. You can add further levels. On one level, you can add several trackers. So it's a very flexible view. So that was the traceability matrix. And now uh, let's see the next uh, feature supporting this uh, requirement-based testing, which is the requirements coverage view. 
So, um, the requirements coverage view can be activated from the requirements tracker view. This, what you can see here, is a requirements tracker view. It's a document view of the system requirement specifications. And by clicking on this microscope icon on the right side, the test coverage icon, uh, the coverage page will be displayed. So I click on it. And then the, the um, tracker coverage uh, page appears. This page consists of three panels. The first panel is the filter panel, in which you can filter your view with, based on many things. Just uh, to mention a few, uh, here is the coverage filter. You can filter the covered items, which are covered by test cases, the not covered items. From the covered items, you can filter the past, the failed, the blocked, and so on. So even the test status can be filtered by the coverage filter. We have an interesting feature here. It's called feature stability. It means that a, a, a feature is stable if all the test cases that belongs to it has the last 10 test executions successful uh, passed. So this means feature stability. You can filter for feature stability too. You can filter for test configuration which means that uh, when you are, you are doing your tests, uh, you do your tests of your hardware and software items in different configurations. Uh, using the example of uh, testing a car, it could be the test configuration, sloppy road, normal road, uh, dirt road, and so on. So the different uh, traveling conditions. And you can filter your test results for the configurations too. To support the test cycles, we also provide the feature test run release. If you organize your testings into cycles, which will be, uh, let's say, miniature releases, sprints, testing sprints, let's say testing sprints, then you can also filter all the results based on the testing sprint, and you can see that in a different testing cycle, how much your, how, how your um, a requirement or feature set was covered by tests and what was the results. So this is test run release. Here uh, there is a running interval. If you are interested in that between some dates, what were the test results, you can also filter for that. You can filter for the tested build. Uh, each test run, uh, each execution of the tests, you can mark it with a build so that they can belong to a build and you can filter for that build. You can filter for the round by, so it means that the testers who perform the tests. And you can set up how many test runs should be displayed in this view. That's the first panel, the filter panel. Let's see the second panel, the statistics panel. The statistics panel provides you information about uh, how, uh, the different uh, trackers in the different projects, because uh, so. Uh, it provides information of the of the statistics of um, uh, coverage of your items and also their results. Uh, the totals are also displayed here. Uh, each the total of each row and also the column totals are visible here. So that's the statistics page and the la the statistics panel and the last panel is the uh, interactive tree panel in which you can see your tracker the same way as the document view in this tree view and you can interactively open the different uh, requirements and sub requirements and you can uh, discover their uh, coverage or uh, we have a coverage uh, indicator in the second column which uh, gives you information about the coverage status the coverage status can be um, not covered, incomplete, and uh, after failed, passed, or blocked, or even partly passed, but let's not go into this detail, but it, it gives you an overall status, and the higher level coverages are accumulated from the lower level items. So if there are two requirements in, uh, in, in a folder, then uh, the coverage of the, the folder depends on the coverage information of both requirements, and it's cumulated 
using and logic. So if any of the test fails, then the parent item is also fails. And you can um, change this logic by checking this checkbox in the header of the tree. Calculate coverage with OR. If you check this checkbox, the coverage will be computed using the OR logic. So you can, you can implement a more strict a coverage uh, analysis or a less strict by this checkbox. And um, uh, if your uh, requirements are organized into releases, you can, you can um, open the coverage view of the release also. Now I change to the coverage view of the release. This is a release in which some of these requirements are included. And here, a similar view is displayed. Uh, the difference here is that the items in the tree and also the statistics, they belong, all of them, they belong to the release. A release in CodeBeamer can contain requirements from several uh, projects and several trackers of several projects. And uh, in the coverage view of the releases, each tracker of each project is a, is a top level item in the tree and you can uh, um, see the coverage tracker by tracker as well in the filter you can um, filter for trackers so if you open the tracker filter all the trackers of all projects that belong to the release will be displayed here and with using the checkbox you can choose from the trackers which tracker to show Otherwise, the filters are uh, same as in the requirement coverage, which I already described for you. So this is the release uh, coverage view. And uh, so these are the features uh, that support the requirement-based testing. And uh, I think I... I uh, presented all that I wanted to. So I give back the presentation to Eve. Okay. Um, thank you for your attention, and uh, and uh, now the next section, uh, the next section of the, this uh, webinar would be the questions. So, if you have any questions, please uh, write them to us, and we will try to answer. Yes, and uh, thank you, Chandler. So, um, we already got some questions. One question was that. Um, if the slides are available. So yes, the slides are available. You can find um, the entire webinar on our website um, under the webinar section. And uh, you can also find uh, the entire presentation material on slideshare.implant. Uh, Before we close today, uh, I would love to ask um, just two more questions that help us to improve the webinar. In the meantime, if you have any questions, and just please just uh, type it in and the answer to this. So the question is, uh, would you like to receive further information about Cold Beamer? We're more than happy to send you this one. Thank you. And my very last question is just, how did you feel about the two-day webinar? Was it worth it? Is there anything else that can be better? Be more than happy to, to you know, you know, to, to receive your feedback to try to improve it. Thank you very much. So, if you do not have any questions, I do not see any questions. Uh, then we close for today and we're looking forward to seeing you in our uh, next webinar which is going to be about Kanban uh, dashboards and reporting on uh, Wednesday next week. Thank you. Goodbye.